To me, making Juneteenth a federal holiday wasn't just a symbolic gesture. It was a statement of fact for this country. To acknowledge the origin of the original sin of slavery, to understand the war was never fought over it. It wasn't just about the Union, but it was most fundamentally about the country and freedom. To remember, the Emancipation Proclamation wasn't just a document. It captured the essence of freedom that galvanized the country. It proved that some ideas are more powerful. They can't be denied. It's a reminder that the promise of America is we all are created equal in the image of God, and we deserve to be treated equally throughout our entire lives. President Biden speaking last week at the White House's Juneteenth concert. Today is the federal holiday that honors the day the last enslaved African Americans in the U.S. learned they were free. 158 years ago today, soldiers from the Union Army rode into Galveston, Texas, and posted a written copy of the Emancipation Proclamation on the door of a local church. Joining us now, Pulitzer Prize-winning historian and professor at Harvard, Annette Gordon-Reed. She's the author of the award-winning book entitled On Juneteenth. And Reverend Al, you have the first question. Yes, uh, thank you for being with us. You know, one of the things that I think a lot of people miss uh, that you deal with in the book is that if it had not been for the Union Army coming in and posting it and protecting those enslaved, uh, they, slavery would have continued, which is in many ways 100 years later with the Civil Rights Movement asking for federal intervention, even now as many of us are dealing with those issues. It has always been a battle of the union or the federal government protecting people against states' rights. So in a contemporary setting, as we celebrate Juneteenth Day, talk about the uh, policies that we still must uh, extract from that that are relevant today about protecting the rights of those enslaved or those that are treated unfairly or those that are treated unequally is part of the lessons of this day. It's not about just drinking Kool-Aid and celebrating. Yeah, no. The, the red soda water is a part of it, but it's not the only thing. No, I, I would suppose you would, we're thinking about making real the kinds of promise of emancipation and what the former enslaved people expected uh, when slavery ended. And the idea was to become a full citizen, to have full voting rights, to be treated equally, the right to make contracts, all, and to protect your family, all of those kinds of things, the sort of political and civil, civic rights that other Americans shared. So I, I would think continuing, making real that particular <clears throat> promise is something that we're still working on. And so, Annette, what kinds of policies do you think are the most prominent, most important ones that are perhaps being over, overlooked um, or even falling back, given the division that we're facing today? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is voting rights and the concern about the capacity of all registered people, adults who are citizens of the United States, to be able to vote for their representatives. There are many things. I mean, we could think of the economic right. disparities that still exist and so forth. But I'm thinking about you know, what the freedmen were thinking of, and they wanted economic, economic equity, and they wanted to be able to make a living for themselves. They wanted to be able to vote. All of those kinds of things are still pertinent today. Let's bring in MSNBC correspondent Tremaine Lee into this conversation. Tremaine, you recently visited Galveston, Texas, the origin of today's holiday, holiday. And what did you find out? That's right, Mika. Going back to Galveston, the birthplace of Juneteenth, uh, and talking to folks there who said the one thing that was really important to folks, the formerly enslaved, one of the first things they did was buy up as much land as possible. Community mattered. They wanted to build institution, institutions and houses, uh, but it was at threat at every turn. And even in a contemporary sense, it continues to be um, at risk of, of losing everything they built. So I went down there to talk to folks about those forces that are colluding against the black community today. Let's take a listen. You're here on the southwest corner of 22nd and Strand, where the Juneteenth story began. It's been 157 years since the very first Juneteenth celebration, here on the island of Galveston in Texas, where the last of America's enslaved black people were finally freed. So Sam Collins is the co-chair of the Juneteenth Legacy Project. Practice. 
We're at the Colored Church on Broadway, where the Union soldiers would have moved through the city and posted the notice, General Order Number 3, on the door here. General Order Number 3 required absolute equality, but for Galveston's black community, equality has been anything but absolute. People talk about Black Wall Street in Tulsa, but there were many communities that were successful outside of those stories of places that were destroyed. Galveston was one of those thriving communities. He says low-paying jobs, a rising cost of living, young and middle-class black folks fleeing for better opportunities elsewhere, all drained historic neighborhoods. And then in 2008, a near death blow to the black community, Hurricane Ike. Tonight, Galveston is a soaked and shattered disaster zone. 75 percent of Galveston's houses and other buildings were taken out by the storm, including nearly 600 units of public housing. The primarily black residents who lived there had no choice but to relocate. Between 2000 and 2010, Galveston's black population plummeted by 37 percent. The city was eventually forced by the federal government to bring some public housing units back. Then came the pandemic. As struggling families dislocated, Galveston drew in wealthy investors. So many of the homes that used to be occupied by black families are now short-term rentals. Black families moving in? No, I, I, I have almost never heard of any black families moving in at all. Generations of June Pulliam's family grew up in Galveston in this century-old clapboard house by the Gulf. I recognize this front porch. Yes, that's the front porch of where we are now. This is my great-grandfather, Ralph Albert Skull, who was five the year of Juneteenth. Folks used to call this place Island of Color, a name that's faded with time. I guess what's at stake is just the preservation of this very important history. They made homes for themselves. They educated themselves. They formed organizations. I want to bring back black folks having some economic influence on the island. Longtime resident Anthony Griffin is breathing new life into old black Galveston. We want to put commercial development there, place a hotel on the other side of the street. We own three or four lots on the other side. His plan, buy up as much land as he can to house and employ families still fighting for the true freedom that was promised. If you don't have economic opportunity, if you don't own land, if you're not able to participate fully in the American dream, you can't ever have absolute equality. 